Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. What up, what up, what up, podcast, party, people, how you doing, how you living, how you hanging, January, we've almost made it through, we've almost made it through January, fuck, you know times are crazy when you're going, fuck, it's, it's, Dan- it's January almost over? We almost made it through. Fuck. In one of those months. It has been one of those months. It's been one of those days. Actually, my day's mostly gone good. I got a little. I got. I had a little. I had a little bickering with the wife this morning. I had a little argument. Not even an argument. It was just a little flare-up with my sugar pie. We don't argue very much these days. But when we do, it goes hard and fast. It goes right into it. Goes right into it. I don't know. I don't want to say anything about it. I don't like to share my... It was just a morning. I was like, ugh. Left here. I was supposed to drop some shit off. And some shit that I had packed from my mom's because I'm clearing my mom's house, as I told you last week. Getting rid of... She had to move out. She's moved into a care facility now after having a heart attack and a stroke and bleeding of the brain. So, uh, yeah, goodwill stuff. And uh, I told a story about how my mom is a hoarder, a hoarder extraordinaire. Hoarder extraordinaire, let me tell you. And I asked if you guys would share your hoarding horror stories. I got one on YouTube. <clears throat> which was just basically, oh my God, my mom is the fucking brutalist hoarder ever, which I don't know if I have here. Do I have here? Let me see. Where is it? I'm going to have to mute this immediately. It might be muted already. Here is Eve. Ah! There it is. It was a guy down at the bottom. He's talking about his mom. Oh my God, my mom. What was it? Jake Mice writes, my mom is one of the craziest hoarders on the planet. She gets so many clothes and lots of odds and ends. It's so crazy what mothers can do when they want to shop. You go, you guys know what I'm talking about. But then Kevin Durr wrote a hoarder. Uh, <laughs> why can't I say this today? Hoarding horror email to me. Summary, my mother is a bag lady. <laughs> And not calling my wife out for breaking dry January lands me a blowjob. So that's the summary of this email, which I thought was great. <laughs> it said, holy shit, great podcast intro, Rob. I'm going through a sit- s- but, uh, something similar here. My 78-year-old mother slipped and fell on the ice before Christmas, had hip replacement surgery, and is now recovering in rehab. <clears throat> I've been busy getting... Why can't I talk to... I've been busy getting her home ready for her return so that she can get through her house with a walker. So, someone who didn't stock up on plastic bags before the plastic bag ban would see her house as a fucking gold mine and literally everything she owns is bagged up to protect it from what? Dust? Question mark? (laughs) Who knows? Question mark. And yeah, paper, magazines, receipts from the 80s. Holy shit. Why? Why? I know. Oh my God. My mom had magazine, Sunset Magazine, you know, like that kind of like homemaking magazine with like recipes and, oh, you can paint your houses, put, you know, put, put yellow curtains up with a splash of gold paint on the wall like, from the fucking eighties. I'm like, who, who's keeping a copy of Sunset Magazine? Back to Kevin Durr. Sadly, I was supposed to pick her up this week, but she's now positive for COVID. She had the first vaccination while in rehab. I'm hoping her symptoms will be minimal. I'm also a dry dry January guy. Been doing it for about 10 years. Awesome. My wife was doing it with me this January. However, two weeks ago, she failed. (laughs) Two weeks ago. What's today? Today's the... That's like a week into dry January that she failed. (laughs) 
today's only like the 25th or something right yeah maybe maybe she made it two weekends she snuck some vodka Ooh, snuck it snuck some vodka into her nightly water mug and didn't tell me we have been married for 16 years so i noticed she seemed a little happier and more talkative than usual <laughs> that night we watched my octopus teacher awesome that's a great movie man i fucking that movie was so awesome if you haven't seen the octopus teacher you got to see it it's really really good and she was tripping about how cool it was holy shit they are amazing highly intelligent and fascinating creatures anyway i decided not to call her out on it even though he clearly suspected that she was drunk and probably smelled it because when you're sober you can smell booze from on a motherfucker from a mile away figured i'd watch her enjoy her buzz and not say anything i ended up getting a blow job that night fuck yeah <laughs> says kevin <laughs> says kevin Durr. Yeah, that is pretty good. She was probably like, uh, he didn't call me out. Yay. Thanks for keeping the content coming. Can't wait to hear some new Machine Head songs. Kevin Fish, nickname from college where I drank like a fish and many people only know me as Fish. Kevin Fish Durr. There you go. I, uh, I also got, oh, you know what I got? Let me read another one too. I got another letter from somebody. This letter is from Bill Ford. This is in response to my parent porn uh, conversation that I had in my intro a couple of uh, as a couple of intros ago. And he was I was asking if they had ever if anybody had ever caught their parents in peculiar situations. I think I might have. I can't remember why I brought this up. I might have told a story about how I snuck i used to sleep in my parents bed when i was like eight or nine or whatever like you know as all kids do and i came in and they were both naked of course at the time i didn't think anything of it i was like oh you guys are naked <laughs> anyway i asked people to write in <clears throat> so this guy missed the uh he missed it but it's parent porn sort of this is a pretty funny story though bill ford wrote what's up sir flynn my name is bill i grew up in rhode island currently reside in texas love the show love all your tunes anyway when my brother and I were in the were kids in the late eighties and early nineties, my mother had a super douchey machismo motherfucker and of a boyfriend machismo. I love that he said machismo. The guy was a total dick, and we hated him. A because he was a dick, and B because we could hear his, this really loud ass Rhode Island motherfucker banging my mom sometime in the next room. We were super poor and lived in a one bedroom apartment with really all caps, thin walls. <laughs> one random night we wake up hearing this blowhard grunting away. And of course my brother and I are trying not to laugh while at the same time mortified as fuck <laughs> fast forward a bit and we hear my mother going to the shower and this fucking guy just yells out of nowhere in that godforsaken douchebag wannabe tony soprano voice <laughs> in that douchebag tony soprano wannabe tony soprano voice i'm a fucking machine <laughs> that's my best east, that's my best rhode island east coast wannabe soprano. i'm a fucking machine yo my brother and I fucking lost it and started laughing our asses off. Full blown belly laughs. There was no hiding it. So this motherfucker comes bursting into the room in his underwear and fat ass Harry Glory. What's so fucking funny? Go to fuck go to fuck to sleep. <laughs> that's that, that's as good as I get with the soprano with accent, all right? What the, what's so fucking funny? Go to fuck to sleep. So for the next couple of years, until they split up, anytime that dick would say some shit to piss us off, which was often, my brother and I would yell, I'm a machine, mocking his pseudo manliness. Years later, come to find out that dude fell off a roof and broke his back and is paralyzed from the waist down. So I guess the machine is out of commission. Fuck that guy. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the story as much as I hate reliving it. <laughs> Stay safe. Much love and respect. Bill Ford. Right on, Bill Ford. Right on for right night in. That's a good one. I'm a fucking machine. I like it. That's some good shit. Some funny shit, man. I uh let's see. I don't have a musical guest to say, so I'm not even gonna play any music for you. I'm gonna tell you about how on Saturday I fell off. My wife and I spectacularly fell off dry January. And granted, you know. I'll make a big excuse here. I only drink two days a week. I drink Friday and Saturday. So, you know, it's, it. it's two days a week. Sunday through Thursday, sober as a judge. Don't touch it. Don't even drink it. So, but on Wednesday, I had to go to 
uh, I had to go to a brewery who wants to do a machine head stout collaboration with us. And I was like, all right, I got to find, I got to drink beer. Like I got to drink something. So I went there. It was great. I'm not going to, I don't want to go too much into it, but they were a great beer company. They had some awesome beers, super nice guys. And, uh, it was good shit. So I drank, I didn't get drunk. I drank probably like, uh, two beers maybe. And, uh, but you know, so much for dry January, it just failed this total failure. So then Friday came and Geneva was like, I'm drinking. She texts me like bottle of wine. I'm drinking <laughs> like a little bottle of wine emoji. And I'm like, all right, I drink. I'm drinking. Cause I feel like I'm doing a happy hour. How do I host a happy hour and not drink? I planned on just doing the happy hour drinking though for the acoustic happy hour and then not drinking the rest of the night or Saturday that failed miserably because my wife was all on board. And I was like, all right, fuck it. We went out, we got a little space heater in the garage and put, got, put our parkers on. It was cold. And so it got in there and just, it was, a, it was a great time on Saturday night. We, uh, <clears throat> on Saturday night, we busted out, you know, we always listen to just music. So just kind of, I play whatever until she gets annoyed with whatever we're listening to, which, in some cases is almost immediately and in other cases is you know it can go a while so i was like we were listening to uh what were we listening to we started off with something something mellow and then i was like i was like i gotta listen to some fucking metal like jesus all we're listening to is 70s crap so i was like i busted out some dio i busted out some heaven and hell i busted out some some other like you know, and then you know, somewhere along the night, she was like, why don't we, why don't you put on Queensryche? And I was like, all right, which one? She's like, Operation Mindcrime. And we put on that record. God, man, what a record. I just, I just sent out a general journal about this, but fuck, that is such a good record. Really just phenomenal album. I mean, all, I, I mean, I loved early Queensryche. I loved the, the I mean, the first record, the, the EP was the first thing I heard, Rampage Radio. Shout out to Rampage Radio, Ron Quintana's KUSF, now defunct, but he also did Metal Mania fanzine. He was on it. He was awesome. And uh, he covered them. He would play the shit out of that Queen of the Reich song. The Queen of the Reich. It was killer. And uh, so I was into I was into Queen's Reich for a while, and I followed him through all their records. And then when that record came out, I just remember being blown away by Queen's Reich, man. Operation Minecraft. I'm not going to play any of the songs because I'm so sick of the goddamn copyright strikes that we keep getting in on all these YouTube posts. So I'm going to not put it, but I'm just going to say if you haven't heard Operation Mindcrime by Queensryche, put that shit on right now. Pull it up on Spotify or YouTube or Apple Music or whatever you listen to. If you haven't heard it in a while, dust it off. It's a fucking great record, man. All the way, all the way to the end. Eyes of a Stranger, last song on the record, killer song killer song so many great songs on there speak the word the word is all of us good shit man so we rocked that we rocked that for a while and it was probably too late we were like all right we're getting late it's almost time for bed so we didn't get through the whole record but then i've since listened to it again and uh we vowed to listen to it again next week so I was talking about it. Somebody's like, you need to get Jeff Tate on the podcast. That would be awesome. Anybody who knows the Jeff Tate camp and they're listening, I'd love to have you on the podcast. It'd be awesome. I'd love to talk some old Queens right with you. Um, yeah. That's about it. This podcast is presented to you on the Gas Digital Network. If you would like to subscribe, you can enter the code, head over to gasdigitalnetwork.com forward slash live, enter the code NFR, get 14 days for free, not to mention you save 10% on the subscription and subscribe. What do you get in a subscription? A subscription gets you early access. You can listen to these podcasts on Tuesday, no commercials other than this kind of shit that I'm talking about. And, uh, and yeah. I, I'm thinking about exclusive content, and no, I don't think I have any, but <laughs> but that's what you get. So subscribe, support the channel. I always appreciate that. You know, it's a fucking goddamn pandemic. We ain't on tour. You know, if you want to support this in some way, I know some people support via the, the Facebook and the other subscription-based things, but you can support this channel by doing that. And it's always appreciated. It's only $4.99 a month. 
I think it's even less than that if you do the NFR code. So yeah, it is also brought to you by Nuclear Blast Records. They are the purveyors, the finest purveyors of heavy metal in the universe. Got an awesome roster of awesome bands. They have great physical product. They've got CDs and vinyl, deluxe vinyl from all kinds of your favorite artists. Meshuggah, Opeth, Nightwish, Slayer, Machine Head, Madball, Hatebreed, so much shit. They got even more, you know, over in Europe. I think they got Behemoth. They got a couple other artists over there too. So yeah, good stuff, man. Good stuff. Head over to nuclearblast.com. They also have a Euro store, so check that out. Anyway, I'm very, very very stoked about my next guest. This lady has been, she's awesome. I love, I love this lady. And I have a lot of ladies on, you know, this, I don't know if she's my, no, she's not my first lady, but I don't have a lot of the ladies on. We got to get more ladies on the podcast. Anyway, this is Melissa Cross, vocal teacher extraordinaire, the Zen of screaming, the queen of scream. All of those titles, she's trained Randy Blythe, Corey Taylor, David Drainman, uh, the singer for Shinedown. She has been really, I can't, I tell you, I took lessons from her back in 2011. We talk, we talk about all this stuff, but she, uh, I started doing some acoustic happy hours right at the beginning of the pandemic. When we were all locked down, couldn't tour anymore. I was like, I got to keep on fucking playing music or I'm going to lose my mind. Anyway, when I first started doing them, I, you know, I pretty much sucked. Like, I, my, I, this is not my forte. Clean singing with an acoustic guitar is not my forte. Not what I've done. I've been, you know, in Machine Head for 29 years, almost 30, 30 years this year. It's going to be 30 anniversary, 30 year anniversary of Machine Head this year in October. So I've been singing heavy in one way for coming up on 30 years. No training, very little training. And then I took training from her uh, about a decade ago, right before Locust. And it helped me a lot, but it still was more, more geared toward the heavy singing. And so when the, when the pandemic kicked in and I started doing the acoustic happy hours, I was like, man, I suck at <laughs> this clean singing shit. Like I'm okay, but like, fuck, there was some night and I just knew, I knew I wasn't doing good, but I just had to keep doing it. Like if I didn't keep doing it and just suck, if I didn't suck in public for eight weeks straight, I would just not continue it at all. I would just not do it. And I'd just stop. So I, uh, and so in the end, I ended up calling her up at one point. I was like, Hey, I'm doing this. And you know, can, maybe you can help me with this. Cause I just don't, you know, I'm not rapping my, I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. And, and I know I can sound better. And some days it sounds great. And some days it sounds horrible. And, and I don't know why. And so she has been awesome. She's totally, we've been doing that. We probably have, we, we dipped off the lessons in the last couple of months, but I'm for sure about to kick them back up because I really enjoyed them and they really helped a lot. And um, it's just cool to have, you know, just when you're to, to be this far along in your life, you know, I'm 53. I, as I said, I'm not trained in really anything like guitar, singing, anything, you know, the handful of lessons that I took, I was, I think it was only like three or four days or something. So to actually like actively focus on improving yourself and, you know, taking this time, the way I look at it, like, look at the pandemic, like if there was any good thing that came out of the pandemic, I took vocal lessons to get better at my clean singing. Now my clean singing sounds dramatically better. So not everything is bad in the pandemic. I never would have started doing acoustic happy hours, which never would have allowed me to focus only on my clean singing. And so, you know, everything happens for a reason, man. And sometimes life takes you down a path and you don't know why. And then fucking you're like, man, I'm glad, <laughs> you know, it seems like it's bad and then something good comes out of it. So I'm going to bring, I'm going to get you to my next guest here. She's a force of nature, this one. And man, what a heavy conversation we got into. She was really, really open. And this is a great, she's a great guest. So uh, stick around and enjoy. And if you want to learn anything about that, I'll include a link to her. She, her name is Melissa Cross, 
Zen of Screaming is her thing. She's got DVDs out. She's been on CNN and a million other places. Anyway, the mighty, mighty Melissa Cross. Melissa Cross. <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> Queen of Scream. <laughs> no, actually, you gave me another name. Do you know what you you called me? What's that? Metal Yoda. <laughs> you called, <laughs> you called me Metal cool. Yoda. <laughs> Metal Yoda, am I? Yes. <laughs> Make the vocals heavy, you will. <laughs> So I, yeah, we've been friends a long time. We have. I met you in 2006, seven. Did we? Okay. Yes, yeah. we met. And then I, and then I, we met like at a, on a tour somewhere. You came out yeah. to see somebody we were on tour with. Well, <laughs> sound, sounds of the underground or like one of those. I don't know. Right on. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Remember we talked and I was like, eh, I don't know if I need lessons, but it sunk in. And then three <laughs> years later, 2010, I came out to New York and we yeah. had a little, uh, I had, I stayed there for a couple of days and just took oh, some yeah. pretty intense. That's was, right. I mean, we were our four hour sessions, like some pretty intensive sessions. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, I like to work with you. So, you know, you're, you're an enigma, enigma. <laughs> <laughs> You know you what I remember most about working. what? You know what I remember most about being at your place that first time because you were was it thirty third? You were off of thirty third, like you were over by like Sam Ash and like all the kind of music stores, yeah, weren't you? It was thirtieth, but it was right next to Madison Square Garden. Yes, like you can yes. see Madison Square Garden across the rooftops right there. Yeah, and I remember you had a uh, you had an acoustic guitar there that you were like, oh, like this guitar is like really special and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I got uh, two of them. The Taylor or was it something else? No, these are called no. Collins guitars and they're made in, yeah. they're handmade in Austin. So it's, uh, they are like Bill Collins is, um, uh, really known for his arch top thing. Actually, he passed away last year. Rest in peace, Bill Collins. But, uh, he makes these, um, gorgeous guitars with the same specs as pre-war Martins, you know, like the bracing's the same as a pre-war and the, and the, I have these two guitars that have the most badass piece of wood that, I mean, the wood itself, <laughs> it's like Brazilian rosewood. Like there's no more Brazilian rosewood in the world because there's an embargo on it because of the rainforest. So I got these, I just didn't want to buy another guitar in my life. I wanted the perfect guitar, right? And I, that I wanted my, my guitar. So I searched high and low for the perfect guitar and I picked up this Martin and it sounded like God. And I said, how much is this? How much is this? And it was an old Martin. He said, it's $90,000. <laughs> like, I said, cool. okay, <laughs> I can't afford it, but I remembered the sound and I went hunting around for a guitar that sounded like that. And I found it and went down to the guy's factory. And I said, I want the best piece of wood, but I want you to make me a guitar. <laughs> and so he gave me this piece of wood that was supposed to be for David Crosby. And he made oh, me sure. a beautiful guitar, right? And then I put a humidifier in it and like a uh, Dunlap, like a Dunlap uh, humidifier in it. And it swelled up the seams. Like my $6,000 guitar is like completely ruined by this humidifier. And I sued Dunlap oh. and I got another guitar. <laughs> oh, wow. That's that story. I don't know Crazy. how we got talking about this. That guitar, that guitar though, I, I was pretty, I, I was, uh, I remember we, we took a break or something. You had to go do something. And so I was just in there noodle around on that guitar. And I ended up writing uh, This Is The End off of the next record, Locust, on that guitar. I was just oh messing around. God. and I. Oh my I God, I am so honored. I wrote the, I wrote the bridge of this is the end, which is kind of also basically the same as the verse, just a slowed down version of it, essentially. But uh, I just remember like taking it. I was like, fuck, this guitar is killer. And I was just vibing on it and jamming. Oh, like, my God. I, was, I, I can't believe my guitar has that legacy. That is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me that I before? Always, I, 
it was a good experience going out there and i was like fuck i gotta like really like you know hunker down and getting this stuff done and uh, and then we kind of and then i think i tuned in with you a couple more times but then i took a break and then we have recently reconnected quite a bit because of the pandemic i'm doing these acoustic happy hour shows and i was like this is way out of my fucking comfort zone i need to die, you know like i sang heavy and i got the heavy down for you know doing it but like this was a whole new world and you really helped me with that and just oh my god but you 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 sang this song for your wife a springsteen song and it blew me away and that's how i knew that this was not going to be a long shot by any means because when you did this springsteen song uh, oh, i did born to run born to, born run, to run right and you really like got you know it's like perfectly in the center of your voice right and usually when you're yelling your ass off on stage you're like you know keys way too high because you're like ah, 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 you know <laughs> that's that sound but you're such a crooner man such a crooner you have this big round like wow like velvet <laughs> thing going on and i was like who the fuck is this <laughs> so it's been a real joy watching that i don't know if any all your all these guys know because if you're not at Facebook Live every Friday, you wouldn't know. But your voice is something else. Oh, and when you sing black, oh my God. Thank you. Thank you. Like you 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 give the, you give the oh, original. Yeah. It's funny too, because like to start taking these kind of vocal lessons, I don't know, 30 years into my <laughs> singing career is just, I just feel like the biggest idiot, but I'm like, fuck it, I'm doing it. And you know, now like you know, in some ways with, with the pandemic, like I probably, I mean, I never would have done an acoustic happy hour. I might've done an acoustic tour and I was looking into it, you know, like even before the pandemic, I was looking into doing some just acoustic dates and just spreading my wings and trying some other stuff. You know, I was going to, I was actually going to do a, a tour with my family and just bring like my wife and kids out. We were just going to get a bus and I was just going to play like small 400 cap clubs around Europe cool. right after our other European tour ended. And what so in some ways it was, it almost kind of set, you know, the happy hour up to kind of happen. And, and, yeah. um, you I, know, saw I think you my mind, I, my mind had already gone there. Yeah. Because I saw you do an acoustic show at Nam at like, in yeah, like 2011 right. or something. You did like the yeah. darkness within. And yeah, I was like, songs. Oh my God. That's, that's my, that's my favorite. You, you know, oh, because you. you remember they asked me, I, I asked you, uh, America's Got Talent. They've called me twice now and oh, yeah. they wanted me to go on television <clears throat> and do something <clears throat> metal. And I ultimately said no, because I realized that they were setting me up because, you know, that shit is not about music. That shit is about television and the television angle for that would be that this, you know, little old lady is like, you know, screaming metal and doing heavy metal songs, but isn't that like a joke? And I thought, I know they're going to do that. And I have, right. I, I just couldn't, that would be such an insult to like the, the genre, <laughs> you know, I, I don't need it that bad, but I wanted to do the darkness within. That would That's been, the song I wanted to do. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Except I can't play it. <laughs> It's too freaking hard. <laughs> I mean, for, for all of you who don't know who Melissa Cross is, she has a series of DVDs that is, you know, pretty phenomenal selling 50,000 plus DVDs, which is in the DVD world, like fucking mind boggling. 100,000. 100,000. 100,000. Actually, it's over 100,000. It. Yeah. I it mean, is. like, for it, you, don't, you don't understand. Like, that's killing it in the DVD world. I know. Crushing it. Yeah. She has trained everybody from, let's see, Dick, Corey Taylor from Slipknot, David Draymond from Disturbed, Matt Tuck from Bullet for My Valentine, Ollie Sykes from Bring Me the Horizon, you know, myself. I mean, Randy from Lamb of God, Jesse from Kill Switch, Alyssa from Arch Enemy. Like, it is a. <laughs> Angela from Arch Enemy. Yeah, Arch and Angela from Arch Enemy. Yes. I mean, all the way back. Oh Keith Buckley yeah. and F 
Phil Labonte and Brian Fair and Toby Morse. And uh, let's, we go way back now. Let's <laughs> yeah. your, who was your first, who was your first client? Like, did you have, was it like a no, known rock singer or? A little bit. His name was Ian Keeler and he was, uh, he passed away. Uh, but he was in a, a, an early, I call it connect the core. <laughs> Van. It was right around the Anthrax time. Oh, okay. uh, it was a band called Dismay, and it it, it, it uh, there is this demo that Dismay did that is like a cult thing that nobody can find. But Ian Keeler, and then right after Ian Keeler was Jesse Leach. Oh wow! Like, okay, yeah, like yeah. it was before Kill Switch was ever signed. Oh wow, that's interesting. Yeah, so this I didn't is- know. Okay, so this is how it happened. There was this guy named Morgan Walker that I went to school with. Morgan signed up all the publishing of all of these bands because he would be driving them around to all the gigs, doing their sound, recording them. And he was building, this, is his, this was his whole vision. He was building a utopia for this genre like we were going to have medical insurance and we we're going to have like you know he was building oh this building the thing and he was using the publishing money right but when roadrunner and all this when you know it all started like you know cooking and major label all that stuff started happening they took the publishing away from morgan and they you know passed a rumor around that he was a pedophile i mean they were really cruel but anyway morgan introduced me to josta introduced me to uh and actually jamie josta never showed up for his lesson he he, he canceled five of them but he told oh. everybody that he was coming the fuck josta <laughs> the fuck <laughs> yeah, he but, told he, but he told everybody he, told he went. <laughs> he told Who's everybody. Bed, <laughs> I'm telling you, it was amazing. And, and then what's really amazing is that, you know, for Headbangers Ball, I think it was like the third, fourth season, like, his voice was like, well, stop, stop. <laughs> like, Jamie, you got to come. But he's fine now. He just burned yeah. right through it. You know, he had this like creaky kind of thing going on. And then it's a perfect piece of callus now, you know. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, Jesse Leach comes in and is Je- Jesse's just raw putty in your hands at this point, right? Like he's just, just tell me what to do. Is he losing yeah. his voice on stage? Is that why he comes in? Is he like losing his voice or like, is he having some stage okay, so, issues? Oh no, This is what happened with Jesse. I went to a show and I saw... Uh, it was right after he took over from Howard and I saw that he was killing himself, just killing himself. And also what he was doing is he was trying to get Howard's timbre and Howard is a baritone and Jesse's not right. So he'd be doing this pushy thing. Right. And really like, you know, going for effort based, you know, and I was like, no, 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 you're, you're coming back, <laughs> get in here. Right. And so he came back, but it turned out that he was injured. So then he had vocal surgery and then we did the rehab together. And now he's perfect. He's perfect. Yeah. You did something so funny. I got to say, remember a couple of years ago when you had this really God awful, like laryngitis and like, this is a terrible thing. Right. And you were so pissed. (laughs) You're so pissed. And you walking down the street, like, you know, doing a live thing. <laughs> and you say, I'm Melissa Cross. Like, she's telling me to do some fucking thing with a straw. <laughs> <laughs> you were like so mad at me because, because I gave you these exercises <laughs> that seemed so stupid and your voice was shot. But you came back, right? But you were like, Melissa Cross, she got me that straw. It's like, I gave you some bad medicine. <laughs> But you got through it, right? Facebook Live, as I often do. <laughs> now I just complain on the pod. <laughs> I know you were in a bad mood because you, when I'm in a bad mood, I'm just miserable. <laughs> like, I know. I'm literally, I'm miserable. telling you, you are such. You are Machine Head is the hardest working metal band in the world, hands down. There's no doubt about it. I've always known that. It's just like the work ethic. Uh, with this band is like 
unbelievable. So I've always known that, that you're like a machine and you're the general. I mean, there's a reason why you are the general because you just don't stop, right? So I I think you're amazing. I think it's like, I, I want to write a book about you, but I don't know about the early part, but I've been, you know, watching you since you were much younger. <laughs> That's awesome. Dude, I use you. your music in my classes too. Yeah, you told me about that. that that's I really use, that may be the yeah. most flattering thing that you would use any that anybody uses any of our songs for oh, anything. Maybe great happy, stuff. You know. Yeah, so but I, you know, for anything. Yeah. I uh, you know what though I I always was um, I was always impressed by how um, you know you've managed to kind of like. I don't want to say corner the market, but really like, you know, I think that you've, you've made people see that rock music is a totally different way of singing and that metal music is a totally different way of singing. And that, and in so many ways, you know, I read, you know, I was just reading a bunch of stuff like, you know, just researching you and it's like, you know, pop music or classical singers or whatever have this kind of built in uh respect almost like they're kind of given the benefit of the doubt like oh like you're singing pop oh you must be really good you know as opposed to like someone like say ronnie james dio who no one you know like that same crowd would automate you know the the america's got talent crowd would not automatically put ronnie james dio up in this guy's as good as a Katy perry or as good as a whoever you know what name your pop singer but <laughs> but he is you know he's just oh. singing it with a grit and with this power and with this that you know, you don't, you almost don't even realize how high someone like Dio is singing because it's just got so much fucking grit. And I remember when I covered the Dio song, I was like, holy oh, shit. I was, was surprised. Crazy. I was like, I was like, this is as high as like a Bruce Dickinson or, you know, even a Halford. It's just not clean. You know, it's not, like, ah, it's not that right. kind of shit. It's a, yeah. Ah. Because you know, it has the bottom, that. it has the bottom yeah. in it. Right. And that any singer like Tom Jones, you know, like the guy that say, what's new, pussycat. Right. He has right. the ability to sing like he sings a high C, but it sounds like middle C because it's got so much girth to it. So it yeah. doesn't sound high, but you go to the piano and you go, whoa, whoa. Yeah. And that that's um, the thing is, is that the same thing that does classical music does that. So actually, like the voice is not really a um, genre specific machine, right? And that's what's really interesting is that I got injured by thinking that my classical training was, you know, throw that out the window because I was in a punk band the first time around and that classical sound was not going to work at CBGB, right? So I just threw everything out the window and just wrecked my voice. And that's how I figured out the classical parts that, actually need to be in the rock parts it's the top and we you know we've been working on that you know yeah. it's the above the pencil yeah. tell, me, so. tell me about all that though i think you've got a uh you know i was kind of i was just kind of going just that I, I i i am grateful that you have managed to help uh i don't know other uh outlets kind of understand you know the that this type of singing is an art, you know, that there is a talent, there is an yeah. art to it. There's a, you know, there's a specific, you know, thing that needs to happen. And some people are good at it and some people aren't good at it. You know, like that there is people who are, you know, just because you're barking into the microphone, you know, doesn't automatically make you great in, in metal, right. you know, like it's got to have a, a thing. So I do, oh, I do genuinely favorite. believe that you have helped kind of transcend that. And I'm always grateful, you know, as someone who has, uh, you know, regularly sees how, in my opinion, metal is often dissed, even by the music business itself. You know, the metal, mm -hmm. the metal awards at the Grammy are in the other room. They're not broadcast <laughs> on the internet. Like it's like we're at like some little step chat. Like, oh, don't don't give them too much attention. Like, what what we're fucking busted. We're writing our songs, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> we're playing our songs. Like all this shit awards to they didn't write that they didn't play on it like what the fuck 
You know? Exactly. So exactly. When I see when I see somebody out there fighting the fight, you know, like you are, like I, it always makes me happy, you know, because I think it is. It, I think it is a fight. Like it is. I feel like it's constantly about trying to prove to people that metal is is you know, in my opinion, even more talented than most of the bullshit that's out there. Not to say that someone like Ed Sheeran isn't talented. He's unbelievably talented. But what we're doing, what a million of my peers are doing is fuck just as talented. Oh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. The thing is, is that I'm a rock chick. I've been a rock chick since I was seven years old. And the reason that I am you know, vast, I've always been magnetized by metal is because it's the closest t thing to the authentic lifestyle identity. And I was thinking about this, like in the 60s, right? All of us were peaceful, good people. We believed in peace and we believed in taking care of each other. And the music was a backdrop to that. And it was them against us and us. We were the good guys. We got shot yeah. at Kent State for protesting the Vietnam War. Nowadays, there is this kind of cracker thing going on that wasn't going on when rock sort of like now uh, there are some exceptions, right? Like there were there were mods and rockers, right? And the mods were nicer and the rockers were kind of the bikers. There is this kind of tough guy thing, but nothing like what's going on now. I'm sort of ashamed at some of our uh, peers in in the metal community. And, um, I, I, you know, I say that's not really metal to me, but I guess to some people it is. But anyway, it is definitely a political kind of point of view that I have a, an affinity with, but the lifestyle choice of metal is similar to what I started with. So I became kind of the den mother or the adult in the room because I was far too old to really be one of you. I don't have tattoos. I'm too old for that, right? I can't. I can't be a poser, but I gotta hey, get involved somehow. <laughs> hey guys, we're gonna take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor. Today we are welcoming back IP Vanish to the show. What is IP Vanish? You remember they've already they've already sponsored us. I've talked about them before. They're awesome. IP Vantage is a virtual private network, VPN for short. A VPN is a super important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. You can use a VPN on your computers, tablets, phones, even things like your Fire Stick when you're streaming media. When you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted. What you're reading, what you're searching, what you're watching, whatever it is you're doing. That's important because what you're doing on the internet is in my business and it's no one else's business either. IP Vanish helps you remain anonymous and secure on the internet. IP Vanish is just $3.49 a month. For just $3.49 a month or $27.99 a year, you can help protect your online privacy and security. Here's everything that you get with IP Vanish anonymous IP addresses. This means your personal IP address can't be tracked by anyone on the web. Circumvent any online censorship. IP Vanish has more than 1,500 servers in 70 plus locations. Get protection when using public Wi Fi. Remember, with IP Vanish, all your data is encrypted so no one can snoop on what you're doing. 24 7 support. Email them, chat with them, even call them. They're there to help. If you remember, these guys supported the show a few months ago. They've come back with an even better deal wanting to offer something special for the new year. You're getting 65% off now. So go to ipvanish.com forward slash Flynn with a lowercase f and claim your 65% savings. They have plans starting at just $3.49 a month or $27.99 a year. This is the time to sign up with our discount and their current promotional offerings. You can get a VPN for 65% off their usual offering. IP Vanish is the best of the best, even rated 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot, and that's with more than 6,000 reviews. Show these guys some love. The repeat sponsors. Remember, it's ipvanish.com forward slash Flynn with a lowercase f, my last name, to get the deal and start protecting yourself online today. One more time, that's ipvanish.com forward slash F-L-Y-N-N with a lowercase f. Let's get back to the show. <laughs> totally. I mean, I think you have, where, where'd you grow up? Where'd you grow up? Where's, okay. where's Mel young Melissa Cross? 
Okay, so I was born in San Antonio, Texas, the former nice. middle capital of the U.S., Tampa and San Antonio, right? Um, but when I was 13, I went to boarding school for the arts. So I went to music school in Michigan, Interlochen, right? And I graduated early. And when I was 16, I went to the U.K. I went to acting wow. school. So I went to what the kind early- of music are you, What kind of music are you into at this point? Like, are you like... Are you into like the '60s, like doo wop, like black music, like rock music? Like, what are you, what are you vibing okay. on? Like Motown or anything like that? Okay, no, no, no. I, I, I am always on. You know, I'm new music. Like, I there's right. that old stuff, and then like I was like I love Janice. I love Jimi Hendrix, and then yes. I also loved Joni. I mean, I saw them. I, oh. I saw them play. Oh. Yeah, uh, I'm fucking old, old, dude. Crap. <laughs> I'm fucking old. <laughs> I have actually met, you know, I met Bob Marley. I met Eric Clapton. I met all, you know, when I lived in the UK, I, you know, hung around St. Peter's Square and Hammersmith and, you know, you know, Stevie Winwood and, you know, it, it was like a. I, no, but like when you're, when you're at interlocking, is that are, is that the type of stuff you're listening to, like Janice and Jimmy and all that stuff? Yes. yes. Yeah. And there, but there was another side of me because there was this folky, this you know, there was Bonnie Raitt and Joni Mitchell, and there was this Southern California kind of acoustic thing that was going on. And I was started to play the guitar, and I started on acoustic. I, Joni Mitchell is like. I love the the rawness of Janice, but I love like the finger picking and the the kind of luscious kind of open tuning thing with Joni Mitchell. So I started playing guitar when I was thirteen, and I started writing songs for guys. That was <laughs> <laughs> because that was the only way I would think I was going to get a guy. Because you know, I got away with murder, but I was kind of a spooky chick, you know, like war, black armband against the war, you know, like dark, you know, always had a guitar with me, always by myself reading, you know, spooky chick, right? right? <laughs> it's like what Lenny says, like you join a band to get girls. You you started a band to get guys. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you could, because if you sing well, you could kind of, you know, and I got tired of asking people to accompany me. So I learned how to play the guitar and At so interlocking though are you studying vocals or are you what are you studying like music theory like just kind of okay so i started as i got uh, into it i i did the piano audition right but i really wanted to be in the, the theater right so when i got there i sort of phased out the piano and did theater and dance because i'd already like take i was a big ballet dancer kind of thing like ballet singing and i studied classical singing at interlochen and dance and theater and but theater uh it was my thing and so i actually went to acting school in the uk a really good school called the bristol old vic which is wow. the place that Daniel Day Lewis went, and Olivia Coleman, who plays the Queen in uh, The Crown, she went to that school. So oh, I went yeah. to really very cool, very. And Daniel Day Lewis is like, and Jeremy Irons went there, and you know it was a very good school, really hard to get into. I got in, and I finished it, and then I just dropped it and said, I got to be in rock and roll. I got to put on my own show. I don't want to be in, you know under some director or some, you know, dependent on, because I was a character actress anyway. Like the parts that I'm good at playing are uh, character parts. I'm not like Juliet, I'm like the nurse. (laughs) Or like, you know, I'm like the, you know, the cameo. So back then I knew I was, you know, not gonna be doing any major success because they weren't parts for women back then. But I knew, that I could do my own show <laughs> and do rock and roll. So I just dropped it all and just said, okay, I'm going to do rock and roll. And I stayed in rock and roll until I was, well, I'm still in it. Right. But I stopped being in bands. When no, I was that, let's not get to stop. Let's go. Like what's the, so you start a rock and roll band and you're in England, London, you're in London or England. No, okay. Somewhere? So I'm in London after I finished, at Bristol, right? I went back and lived in London in Bristol, for a while, hung out with the, you know, the rock stars, but I was hanging out with that, those like kind of 
star kind of people, right? And so, but what was going on is there was this underbelly of something very exciting. And it was like the Stranglers and it was the jam and it was the Sex Pistols and there was something going on. And and the, the, like King's Road was like, they all looked like they were in the band Rancid. You know, like the Mohawks, like the Statue of Liberty uh, Mohawk. Okay, yeah, so yeah. Um, I was I mean, fascinated by I, that. Time, that must have been such an exciting time. I mean, you're like this young woman, you're in London, like this whole music scene's like starting to pop. Like that just oh, yeah. must have been fucking crazy. It was and, fantastic. And I, think, I think in some ways, like, you know, you're going to meet uh, these American rockers or even English rockers like at shows and stuff. And like, you're this American. So in some way, you're this like, uh, you know, you're exotic. You're like this anomaly like oh my god an american's here at my show how cool like can you can you believe that i actually played one of my songs for eric clapton and i was wow. on a session and i was such a little shit do you know what i did i actually had the nerve to tell the guy that was you know it was his studio and he was the engineer and they were doing like pre-pro for slow hand Right. And my boyfriend was like uh, the stand in for George Terry, but it was Ginger Baker, Eric Clapton and this stand in. Right. And I told the engineer, I said, you know, you should tell Ginger to just stick with the two and the four. <laughs> oh, what a little shit. Because, you know, I, I, I was sort of like, you know, into the stones and, and like Ringo, like very simple kind of, uh, 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 right, like rock. And Ginger Baker is like super progressive and like real stick happy, right? And I said, yeah, yeah they, you know. <laughs> but what an arrogant little shit I was to say that, you know? Like, who that's, that's, the Le that's the Layla lineup, basically, right? Like that's the cocaine lineup, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. it, Layla's before it, uh, the the slow hand record was uh, cocaine and um, uh, what's the what's the other one? Well, Lay down, Sally. Yes. You know, thing, Man, thing, that's crazy. Thing, that's crazy. Thing. You're there for that recording session, like hanging out, just chilling. Yes. That's nuts. Yes, and that's you know what else? Was I was Eric, in for Eric that. Nice? Was Eric nice? Was Eric Clapton like nice? Was he cool to hang out with? Actually. Uh, he would say things like, what's the matter? Don't you fancy me? I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> what's the matter? Don't you, fancy me? you don't want I to mean, sleep with me. <laughs> he was a hound dog, right? I mean, his girlfriend was Patty Harrison already, right? Right. Was George Harrison's wife. George Harrison's <laughs> wife. Yeah, which is always the weird. I always thought that was the weirdest thing. I was just like, what? And he was nice about it too, right? But Patty is there, staying there, and he, you know, says things like, you know, what's the matter? Don't you fancy me? <laughs> it's like I was actually, I didn't fancy him, but I, even if I did, I would not have the disrespect to like make a play for, <laughs> for the guy when the, you know his basic wife is in the room. Right. Anyway, right. he was a little arrogant. He was also um, not sober, so he's different now. I would right. really love to meet him now because I'm, uh, you know, I wasn't sober. He wasn't sober. So probably doesn't even remember, but I, this is how, you know, I was on, on the bus for Babylon by bus. That's the whalers tour up the West coast. I was oh, on that bus. In California. So, oh, so you yes. moved back to, okay. So you moved back to the U S after this. Yes. I moved out in the U S and I was in Texas <laughs> for two weeks and I ran away from home and I went to California. Right. Like, and I stayed. Got to get out of here. Yeah, I got to get, get out of this place. <laughs> they kill Bambies here. I got to get out of here. Right? <laughs> so I went to um, San Francisco and I got oh, a job babysitting this five-year-old kid. It, I lived on a Pacific between Hyde and Larkin. And okay. uh, so I would go down to the Fisherman's Wharf and I would uh, do uh, sing songs. Uh, where the cable car turnaround is. Oh, right, right, yeah. And I would bring the kid, right? And the kid, the five-year-old kid, would have a hat, right? And I made so much money because I'd be singing and this little five-year-old was just like, and everybody's like jamming the dollars in the hat. So one time the little kid 
got on the cable car when I was sleeping on a Saturday morning. He escaped. He got on the cable car and went down to Fisherman's Wharf and the police brought him back with a balloon and an ice cream. Well, of course, I got fired, you know, because yes. <laughs> anyway, I have such a past. <laughs> I probably would have fired you, too. Just, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of off. <laughs> anyway, but so you, there's a, but then you move down to, don't you move down to LA at some point? Are you, yes. are you seeing band? Are you going to shows at, in, while you're in San Francisco okay. and like, kind this of, is what happens? This is what happens. Fillmore. Is the Fillmore going at this point? Like all that kind of vibe? Uh, the Cow Palace is, uh, it was called the Cow Palace and the Clapton yeah. tour came. Right. And so there I go, I show up. Right. And I, I got my brand new Les Paul, right? <laughs> that guitar is way too big for me. <laughs> it's a joke, right? I look like so, like, I look like a four-year-old with that guitar because it's like, so anyway, I want to show it to Eric, right? So I bring this, like, you know, Les Paul, and I show it to him, and he says, that's not a girl's guitar. <laughs> this is a girl's guitar. And he, like, hands me this, like, beautiful little Martin. He says, you should be playing that guitar. That is not the right guitar for you. I was like, okay. <laughs> but um, what I did was I went to LA on the roadie bus, right? I said, okay, I'm gonna go with the tour. So I, I, I just like climbed on the roadie bus and we landed in LA and one of the roadies threw my contact lenses out of a glass of water. I took them out of my eyes, put them in a glass of water, boom. So I couldn't see. So I could not go on with the tour and I um, booked myself into a uh, mental hospital because <laughs> I had no place to stay. <laughs> so I went to we, this we've been board at the mental hospital. <laughs> at the mental hospital, I met an orderly who was a guitar player and he uh, I allowed him to kidnap me from the mental hospital because he liked my guitar. I also had a, more, oh, a Fender Twin, which was like, you know, be, like really heavy. So he liked my amp and my guitar. So he let me stay in his apartment. And this was right underneath um, the apartment where Tito from the plugs. So this punk thing is already, you know, happening. So I am staying and we start a band, right? So I start a band with the orderly from the mental hospital and I work at Peaches Records in Los Angeles and it's right next to the mask. So I'm meeting like X and X scene and uh, the blasters and circle jerks and black flag. And, you know, I'm getting all, you know, and then I, I had a band in that scene and I was also working for Denny Cordell at shelter records who had, you know, I was his assistant. So Okay. Anyway, Ugh, there's so much to talk about. Here. I mean, that is, that's crazy. That's I mean, what an exciting time. Like you're hanging out with like circle jerks and black flag and like, the, yes. I mean, this is crazy. I'm playing the same shows. My band is like opening for like the Go-Go's, you know, like that was <laughs> the Go-Go's was part of that. And like, what, do, what do people what do people think of this? you know, classically trained theater girl who's now just screaming her head off in a punk rock band. <laughs> well, okay. So back then, right. The sound was not the same thing that the screaming now. I mean, yeah, back totally. then it was like Susie and the Banshee. So it's like, ice cream, bad, bad, bad. you know, it's, it sounds it like. Was still still <laughs> it, was still it was still singing this, yeah. this kind of thing that, uh, okay. So, Fast forward, right? I I, I moved to no no, 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 stay here, stay here, stay here, stay in the <laughs> punk. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, I, uh, I, I have a band, it's called The Limit. And I'm working for Denny Cordell, who is the Shelter Records. So, Shelter Records was built on Leon Russell and uh, Joe Cocker and the shelter people okay. and gotcha. Denny Cordell produced a, a song called a wider shade of pale by Procol yeah, Harum. Like yeah. Like okay. So that money. Song. Yeah. And Cordell and Chris Blackwell of Island, they were like, you know, 
aristocratic friends. Like there's a whole echelon of aristocracy in the music business. And then there's these sort of hangers on, right? But, you know, it's kind of like a, uh, so, um, uh, Denny gets out of Shelter Records because Tom Petty got bought out by MCA or something, right? So Denny did the first Tom Petty, you know, American Girl and, you know, wow. that first okay. And then and after that, MCA took over. The record company. And you're working wow. at the record company. Yes, I'm working at the record company. And um, I'm, I'm, I got that because, oh, before the, 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 I got the job at the record company because I was a, a, a wait person at this cafe at the top of the uh, Beachwood Canyon. Well, it's up, um, it's off of Franklin, right? Beachwood, and, and, and it's halfway to the Hollywood sign, right? And it's this little, it's called the Beachwood right. Cafe. So I was a, a wait person at the, it was called Waitress then, at the uh, Beachwood Cafe. And I met this lady with a child who was sort of sad. And uh, she started talking to me and she said something about her husband and his name is Peter Green. I went, Peter Green, you mean Fleetwood Mac, Peter Green? He says, yes, he's just like, look. so basically she sends me to Peter Green <laughs> who has basically been lobotomized. I mean, the guy can't even put a sentence together. And I went to a, belly dancing bar <laughs> with Peter Green. Anyway, I got picked up at the Beachwood Canyon to be Denny's assistant. So I became Denny Cordell's assistant and he allowed me to record in the studio. So I released a record in um, Germany <laughs> and, oh, wow. and it was also released in the UK. And it was picked up by this guy named Simon Napier Bell who is the manager of the Yardbirds and the manager of Wham. Oh, and, crazy. Yeah. And so he, but he took my punk band off the record and put this other arrangement and did some airbrushing. And it, it was like very, it, it, it wasn't my vision, right? So I bought, I mean, I hope that I bought all of them. <laughs> I think that, <laughs> um, I saw one, like I did a search for it about five years ago, and I saw that there was one out there, and I quickly bought it <laughs> so that nobody could hear it because <laughs> it's embarrassing. Anyway, uh, I, eventually I was doing showcases for major labels in New York, and um, I did, my manager was Kate Hyman, um, and my Kate Hyman is, you know, still in the music industry. And okay. my yeah. one of my, you know, followers was Jeff Aldridge, who's still in the business. He signed Disturbed, like, you know, two decades oh. later. But I was, mm -hmm. so what happened was there was this major showcase with Warner Brothers and Columbia. It wasn't called Sony. It was called Columbia and Chrysalis. And I bombed really badly, oh, really no. bad. Oh, my God. What happened? What happened? Why did you bomb? Because I was a drug addict and I decided to detox two days before the showcase. And what? it was bad. It was bad. It was so bad that the New York Times was there and they wrote this article in the business section of the New York Times. And I swear to you, it's you could find it. And it said, had she paused for breath? Or had she mercifully finished? And then, quote, yep, she's finished all right. And so Jeff Aldridge, like, rah, 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 rah. it was just God. the worst. And I escaped Connecticut, right? Because I was so. You had a, you had a I, I, we've talked about this uh, privately. I don't know if you talked about this publicly, but I do know that you had some issues with heroin. You were, you were doing a lot of yes. heroin. Is that what you were detoxing off of? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. That is correct. And, you know, speed balls and, you know, cocaine with heroin and, you know, um, and uh, that's heavy. That's really oh, heavy I was, duty. I was a very, very sick, sick person. Um, but I always tried to be responsible. You know, it was like living two lives all the time. But, you know, that eventually caught up with me and I escaped to Connecticut 
And that is where I started to hear anthrax music, right? I started to hear music coming from this club. And it was like, a <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? What is that? And then this kind of squatter kid from Rhode Island was like hanging around and he was going to these shows and all these younger people were just like, like radical, like, you know, moshing. And I didn't know what was going on. But shortly after that, Morgan took me to a show, which was Megadeth, Slayer, and the Bad Brains. So Crazy. I saw this show. I'm, I'm standing on the balcony. I'm looking down at this sea of, so it's the first time I see moshing, right? right. So, right. you know, I, I, you know, now I've heard Pantera, right? But that, that was still like kind of tame compared to what this was, right? And I saw this amazing solidarity. And I was like, oh, this is it. This is not, this is not going anywhere. I mean, this is gonna, this is here to stay. This is here to stay. And I've been there ever since. Like I worship it, right? But that is how, I realized that this genre was probably not going to survive if we didn't figure out how to tackle the vocal problem. Right. Because it was like, lose your shit or you suck. You know, like it was all effort based. The more you lost your voice, the better the show. Right. That was the, the criteria. <laughs> <Right>. yeah. <laughs> like Slipknot is doing this, like sort of like Whoa, and drinking and vomiting. And, you know, that was all like, uh, you know, there were even people that came out and said, "Are we? That, okay, we're not going to take voice lessons." Jesus, oh my God. I was that guy. I was just like, "Voice lessons are for pussies." No fucking yes. way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so that dude. And then one week into my tour, I started losing my heavy voice and was able to keep my clean voice. I'm like, "Oh shit, I'm fucked. I better figure yeah. something out." <laughs> I guess I'm going to turn right. into a pussy real quick here because uh, <laughs> I'm about to take so, some vocal lessons. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think that, you know, being like sort of like the adult spokesperson, like because I'm kind of breaking down, you know, what what this is. This is not Satanism. Like, you know, this is this is this is not what you think people this is really good stuff. Like you should listen, <laughs> you know, so, you know, like the Wall Street Journal. You know, I'm in the, the Wall Street Journal talking about screaming like no one that reads the Wall Street Journal really knows what metal sounds like, really. Yes, right. They see little, you know, snippets of it, but it all sounds like noise to them. They don't understand it. So anytime I can have the opportunity to talk about, you know, the nuance of the whole thing and how beautiful it is and all that stuff, I, I try, you know, because yeah. I believe in it. Yeah. I how long have you been? How long have you been a vocal teacher now? Uh, thirty years. Thirty years. That's 30 amazing. Years. Thirty I mean, that's, years. That's, I started in nineteen ninety. <laughs> and I, you know, the, the the story goes on and on and on. But I did get sober, right? And when I got sober, I lost my, you know, Susie and the Banshees kind of mystique thing, and I got really confessional. An acoustic because I had issues. <laughs> I call it issue rock, right? So I had like issues. And so I did this kind of bleaker street uh, solo thing for about eight years. So I do some covers and then I do my own stuff, right? And I, you know, I was like, I almost got like another big deal, but I was just that close. And I think I didn't believe in myself anymore. I think I lost like the. I don't know. I think I was humiliated by what had happened with that major showcase because that was a big deal. I bombed yeah. really badly. That That's was really, really. Do you know who my lawyer was? My lawyer was U2's lawyer. I oh had the God. U2 lawyer. <laughs> I, and Pat Benatar was like his client. Like he was my lawyer. I blew it so effing bad. But if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have been. I probably would have died, actually. I probably would have died <laughs> because I would have done, just drugged myself into oblivion. Um, yeah. But luckily, I got sober and, um, you know. Yeah, congratulations. That's amazing. How long have you been, you've been sober for 30 years, too? 
I've been sober for 24 years because I had to do some more research. (laughs) I had a relapse that was like the real convincer. Um, So it's been uh, 24 years now. So that's an, that's still incredible. That's an inc- I mean, that's a fuck. I'm going on like six days sober here. <laughs> and I'm just okay, like, fuck. You're different. <laughs> now, dude, you are such a different animal because yeah. you are a white knuckler, right? I'm a hedonist. You have the work ethic. Like you actually stop drinking every January. Okay. Yes, that I is do. not, if you were really a, had a disease, you would not be capable of that. Yeah. You're not, you're not, you don't have a problem, dude. You just like a hard driving, you know, I, I, I have had, I mean, I think at this point, like after all these years, because certainly when I was younger, I didn't have the discipline that I have now, you know what I mean? Like what for whatever, wherever I got it, I, I don't even really know. I mean, before I just did, I would do any fucking drug on, you know, heroin or speed or Coke or, you know, I never really like got into Coke because it always made me throw up, but uh, I was really into speed. So I was like crazy about speed. And so like I would do on tour, just anything, anything that came in front of me, I would do. And then it just, at some point I, uh, I just felt like shit and yeah. I was sick of feeling like shit. Like I just, yeah. I just hated it. You know, like, you know, I'm mean, certainly when I was young, it, you know, you're, you don't get hangovers. You don't, you know what I mean? Like at some point when those hangovers start getting bad, you're like, ugh, like this oh. is hard. Well, and, especially uh, your job. I mean, yeah. you have, and, and then I think at some point somewhere in the middle there, like probably around the blackening, I think this is probably where, around the time that we met because I was, I think I was even talking to you about like I was, my throat was always killing me. And you're like, dude, you got to lay off the drinking. And I was like, <laughs> I was like really? You're like, how often do you drink? I was just like, well, every day, but you know, I'm, I'm only doing six. I'm only doing, you know, I, I, in my head, I wasn't drinking very much. And then I stopped after the show. So then you're like, well, you know, and, uh, and then I didn't listen to you, of course, <laughs> I just kept on drinking. But well, then at one okay. point, but, but, but of a year after that conversation, I remember something you said, just like, well, how much do you drink? And I was like, you know, I was like, I don't like in my head, it wasn't very much. So I was like, well, I'm going to measure how much I, I drink. And so I took a, I took a shot glass. And I, cause I, I do it in a solo cup. I just eye it in a solo cup. I pour my vodka and pour some Coke in and then I drink that. And then I would finish that. And then I'd go on stage and I'd have, you know, I'm like waiting to go on stage. I'm like, Hey, mud Billy, he's my drum tech mud Billy. Bring me the, bring me another, you know, drink. I'd sip on that. So then I go on stage and if it was a good show, like we play an hour and a half show. Like if it was a good show, I'd be like drinking a lot in between like cheers, everybody cheers, motherfuckers, you know, all that shit. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and so I measured my pre-show drink and my pre because I got a shot glass, which is very unusual, right? To have a shot glass in the dressing room. Like you just never, like we had a shot glass and a wine glass and like we were in a kind of a fancy area. So they gave us like all this fancy shit. And I was oh. like, oh, a shot. I was like, I'll measure the drink. <laughs> and I measured it and it was sick. My one drink was six shots of vodka. <laughs> I went, I knew it. I one pre-show drink and I was like oh my god I was like that's a lot and then I was like studded you know and then I get on stage probably another two shots just waiting to go on stage then on stage another three to four shots at least doing cheerses with everybody I was like that's like fucking 11 to 12 shots a day of vodka that I'm doing and then I stopped but then if I had a day off the next day I would then have another three brown eyes so that's another 18 shots and then i have like three or four i'm like i'm drinking like 25 shots and like four beers in a you know <laughs> like this you is have like a, you have a wooden leg uh i was then. but i was a fully functioning alcoholic yeah. like i was fully, yeah. like i could do everything that i needed my throat might have been rough here and there but like i had the discipline and the work you know ethic yeah. to do it and uh and at yeah. some point i just had to go you know, it reached its pinnacle and I had to stop and I just had to take a break for, you know, X amount of time. And then I've, I've kind of gone like where I, I get back into it. And then I reach a point where I'm like, yeah, I feel like I'm doing too much. I better take a break, you know, and I've, I've somehow gotten as, as I've gotten into my older age here, that, that yeah. not, sw- yeah. not really a switch. Cause I can't really turn it off, but it's like, I can go, okay, after this weekend, I need to take a month off. 
You know what yeah, I mean? Or two months sense. or whatever. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Whatever, whatever that, whatever that is that you get with age, that whatever that wisdom is, that's, and that's where I'm at now. I'm like, I need to take January up, maybe go into February and just, you know, write it out and then I'll get back into it. And I can, I can, I can control myself, but you know, sometimes you just need to check, you know, like you need you that know, check. I wonder, I'm almost afraid to experiment with that because yes. I, I just like don't I can't afford the consequences you yeah. know I can't afford it you know I just can't afford it you know I yeah. just I would love a glass of wine because I love the right. taste of wine right mm -hmm. and I, I also also want to taste that peanut butter beer that you <laughs> <laughs> you probably taste that a lot of people taste it and go uh, I don't I don't know I, I, don't, know. I don't know I don't know what you see in this <laughs> but, uh, but, I but I don't, I can't risk it. You know, I, I think, too, and I hear you, I, I, I hear you because I think when you, I don't know if you ever OD, but I OD, you know, like yes. I OD. That, that was such a, it was such a, um, you know, my particular OD was so, uh, uh, like it shook me, like it shook me to my core. Like really? I, I OD, I OD on heroin the night that I signed the contract with Roadrunner Records. So I had just signed it, went to a show that night, a friend of mine talked me into doing some heroin and and like I could have like I should have died that night. You know, like oh and I God. and I didn't. And then a week later my friend died from the same batch of bad heroin. You know, like sometimes a batch of bad heroin comes in and then everybody dies. You know this. Like she's fine. And uh and oh, I remember just a week later being at my friends standing at the, you know, we were burying him. We were outside in the cemetery and I was like, that should have been me. Like that could have been me. And it was such a, you know, like whatever drugs I had done at that point, I'd done a lot of drugs and, you know, have occasionally, occasionally like fell off and done some drugs, not heroin, but, uh, you know, and then on top of it, my wife, you know, her father was a heroin addict and like just hearing her life and, you know, what the wreckage of her past was, you know, to and then comparing that to me, like, why are you doing this? Like, I can't believe you're like, what the fuck? And, you know, and then watching her father die, like her father continued to be a heroin addict, you know, like continued to be an alcoholic. Like he, you know, at one point, right. I remember, remember I was going on tour and the doctor told him, like, look your esophagus is going to separate from your stomach if you don't quit doing heroin and don't quit drinking. And he just kept on doing heroin and kept on drinking. And six weeks later he was dead. And like, I mean, it was like fucking just looking into a crystal ball and all of those, you know, I think all of those things just, you know, they have this, you know, they make a scar in your brain, you know, and it kind of almost makes your path go another way. And I think that's kind of why somehow that kind of shook me out of it and got me out of it and made me step back and go, wow, man, this addiction shit can be really fucking, you know, it's not a joke. It's not, you know, like you want it, you're young and you just think you're invincible and you can do whatever you want. And then you watch like, you know, someone's father who's been addicted you know, into their fifties and then they just die from it. And it's like, you never, you never forget it. Yeah. But thank God you had Jenna with you, you see, because yeah. I think that, you know, when people are lonely, it it is kind of like you play roulette. Like you don't really give a shit if you die or live. And, you know, you're yes. just, you know, you're, you're, you're doing that. I call it roulette because it's too much in the spoon. Then, you know, then I'll die happy. And if it's not enough, then I'll just be as high, you know, but, was always yeah. like going to be too much. And if is it too much, it it's fine because you don't care about yeah. anything. Um, yeah. And it, it and I liked the feeling of not caring because I care too much, you know. So um, but now uh, I, you know, that peanut butter beer or that glass of wine is it's 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 like a, a slippery slope because I know from experience that if I break that bond that I have between other people that have made the same choice. Right. I just have this kind of like, I'm with them. Like I'm not going to do it. And, and and I'm fine with that. And I have my friends that don't do it. And I got my friends that do it. There's no judgment, but I can't afford it. 
Because yeah. I also have a kid. Like I have a kid. Yes. So yeah. uh totally. And that changes your whole Yeah. I mean it changes everything. You know, when you when you have this thing, and you know, some people like you know, I, I, a lot of people who don't have kids and even some who do, you know, in the case of <laughs> Ginevra's dad, you know, doesn't fucking, they just don't care. But right. like it does, you know, a lot of times, you know, your all your priorities change. Like what you're, you know, up until then, your life is about you and like yes. just everything is about you. And then like suddenly you have a kid and your life is about something bigger than you and something exactly. more important. The ultimate freedom. That's why I called my son, my baby Messiah. Because it wasn't about me anymore. And I didn't have to prove anything. Because as long as like he knew that I loved him and I was doing the best for him, everything else was gravy. Like that's my primary purpose is my son, right? So I just can't afford to do a bad job with that. And I know I would if I picked up because somehow there's something that starts where whoop, like there is no like higher being anymore it's all a veil and it's you know i i remember what it feels like to be imprisoned in this you know idea that i have to have some more or i'm going to feel bad you right. know do you find that work that. do you find that work helps that like having you know you've got your classes and you've got your kids and you've got your uh, you know, your students and yeah, that's what I mean, not my kids, students, you know, yeah. like you've got this work that, you know, you drives you like, do you, well, do you feel that? Uh, well, I do because there is a definite sensory experience of being decent at your job, right? When, when I, I, I provide a service and this service means a lot to some people, most people, you know, it's like it changes their life. So I am a part of something that is a little longer lasting than my last show that I screwed up. You know, like it's something that is substantial. And then I have, you know, my my child. So I have a sensory awareness of what it's like to be. I'm OK. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. You know, I, I'm, I'm keeping up. Right. And that is not the same feeling of not wanting to feel the piece of shit in the center of the universe because the piece of shit in the center of the universe. I mean, I, it's funny. I was talking to somebody, most of the people that girl, especially women that are also re in recovery were uh, sexual uh, survivors, right? Like I was raped. At when I was 13 and a lot of women that have that kind of um, shocking kind of traumatic experience get this like numb out ability and that numb out ability is to like you know shut that shit down because you know you go through all this like it was my fault you know if I hadn't have done this it wouldn't have happened and you could da, 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 da. of course I Blame. you know you make it I make it my own fault because if it's not my fault, then who's to blame the universe, you know, and, and why me, you know, so I let it be my fault. But the thing is, is that it makes it dark on the inside. So that numb out thing was like perfect for heroin. It's perfect, right. perfect because it's numb, but it's also velvet and kind of like, you know, that kind of, impressionistic kind of grainy film kind of you know isolation it's kind of velvet being stoned was like a little velvet rubber room you know mm -hmm. um but that's not I, service you know it's funny because i i mean i i always threw up every time i did heroin mm -hmm. and i think and, and i'm and i hated it at the time because i had this kind of romanticized <laughs> idea of heroin like it was grunt like grunge was popular everybody was doing heroin it's like i want to do heroin like everybody's doing heroin this seems cool and uh, and so i did and it always made me at first i just snorted it like i didn't like i didn't want to shoot it i was kind of freaked out about shooting it and then uh and it, but it always made me threw up and then i shot it and it made me threw up and i was just like i never had that what you're talking about would happen it, you know i would feel like very euphoric for sure 
but then mm-hmm. I had to throw up every 10 minutes. So I was just so <laughs> fucking annoyed that I'm throwing up every 10 minutes that I was like, okay, this is cool, but it's not that cool. <laughs> well, wow. I mean, I, I, did you I not have, did you not have that. that? Yeah. Well, I started out, you know, if I haven't done heroin, for, hadn't done heroin for a while, I would get nauseous and throw up. But, you know, after, you know, four or five days, it, it become like tolerant to it and it oh, didn't God. make me okay. sick anymore. Uh, in yeah. fact, I would start throwing up if I didn't have it. It went the oh. other way. So like detoxing is the worst, the worst <laughs> I, I've detoxed, you know, from heroin, but I think the worst detox that I ever did was Valium, actually, like benzodiazepine, like pills, like pills. Ugh. I mean, but why did I do these things? Because, I, you know, it just, it was a compulsion that, you know, I did, I felt really bad inside. <laughs> and yeah. I, uh, I don't feel bad inside anymore. So it doesn't really have a context. I'm very lucky. I am so lucky. Like I should have been dead. Like all those ODs, I, I should have been dead or in jail. Like all the times yeah. that you know I'm, you know, holding and I'm in customs and you know the British <laughs> guy comes up, "Madam, we have reason to believe that you're intoxicated." I was like, "How dare you!" <laughs> <laughs> So bad, you know, on an airplane, like, you know, throwing up on the passenger next to me, like, you know, you know, nodding out with like a cup of coffee and, you know, oh, the worst. My lipstick was crooked. <laughs> I mean, I, I do understand as a fellow sexual abuse survivor, I, I do understand you, you know, when you say that numbing feeling, when you talk about the blame, when you talk about the you know, the shame of it all and, and, and wanting to, you know, black it out, you know, and wanting to numb it down, wanting to not feel any of that or be reminded of it or think about right. it. You know, it happened right. to me when I was five. So, um, wow. I did yeah. not know. Yeah. Well, and, isn't and, that and special? I, <laughs> I, relate, I mean, I relate to it. I mean, I relate to what you're saying, and I and I know why you did it. And I know, like, I could completely connect why you went down that r- route, you know, and and how what a strong pull that is for all, you know, for all drugs, you know, for me because I think because it was I was so young when it happened, like it really kind of shut me down, and so oh, yeah. speed speed became the thing for me because I was so introverted as a kid, and I was so like I couldn't talk. I was very anti so like not antisocial, but like, I just couldn't socialize very well. Like that speed really brought me out of that, you know, speed, like made me like, I can talk to anybody. Like I can fucking do anything, you know, like, and that in some ways, you know, you know, I learned, I learned how to come out of my shell from speed and then just threw away speed and just remained out of my shell. You know what I mean? Like out of that, you know, trauma out of that moment, out of that, whatever. But, you know, it's still, it's still, you know, like, like you said, I think that there always is that, that part of you that wants to blame yourself, you know, like even when you, like, I listen to you talk about your failure in front of the New York times and all this stuff. And like, you know, even now you're still, you know, it still resonates very strongly. Yeah. With oh, you. It was bad. Like, it was, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that blame, that blame is, is heavy. And, you know, I, and, uh, you know, I, pre- I appreciate you sharing your story with, with that, you know, and, and letting people know that you can get past that because you can, you know, like it doesn't seem when you're in it, when you're in those moments, it doesn't seem like you're ever going to get out of it. And, you know, all the baggage that you carry is going to forever be the wreckage of your past. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like it, you can, you can grow and you can go past that. And, I didn't do it alone. I tried to do it alone and I could not. I tried for many years, you know, but that's like, you know, having diarrhea and sitting on the toilet and going, I will not shit. I will not shit. I will not shit. You know? <laughs> I got diarrhea. Okay. <laughs> so I had a lot of help. And part of it was, you know, finally being convinced that I had a problem because the denial, uh, I didn't want to let it go. 
So I had like very, you know, complicated, you know, um, ways of, you know, even after I got sober the first time, I sort of managed to get addicted to like a medical issue with pills. You know, I got her, you right. know, ooh, you gotta like steer this over there with the board which you would do it. <laughs> we'll steer this over there with some, you know, Percocet, you know, like, but it's medical. But in some way, that's almost like that's where they steer you. You know, like they steer you down that route, you know, like it's, you know, it yes. happens. Well, they don't the do it anymore. They don't do yeah. it anymore, but they used to, and they did it really egregiously. It's, it's very bad what they did because yeah. they created I mean, val Valium was, you know, mommy's little helper, you know, like That's right. they just they handed it out. Like, here you go. Oh, like you're, <laughs> you're really talking back here. Have some Valium. You know, yeah, kind of exactly. That, that yeah. yeah. You know, my father was a doctor. My father was a psychiatrist. So it's like, that's a whole nother thing. You know, a British psychiatrist, you know, kind of cold. And, you know, I, I, I was getting, you know, medicated when I was very young. So I kind of grew up in this, like, there's a pill mm -hmm. for everything, you know, right. it was very. Um, but, you know, I like everything that happened because it made me here, right? So. I've had these huge crises and traumas and on the other side, there's always something really beautiful. So, you know, that I'm happy with that. I just really hope there's not a lot more of that. <laughs> I want to kind of retire, chill. Yeah. I don't want any more traumas. Yeah. I just want to, you know, you know, I, I I think that there's enough trauma going on around us at the moment where, you know, I'm very frightened and sad about my country. And, um, you know, I, I used to, I mean, I've been around the world and this is the best place to live. You know, you've been around the world, you know, that this is like really the best place to live. But lately, like, you know, the orange man, he looks like, a sexual abuser. He has, you know, I have ever since the election, he reminds me of a certain type of personality that was part of that abuse. And so I've been kind of living in this like dark place. I know it's not, you know, the orange man's fault, but you know, it, it just, he creeped me out and uh, it's creeping me out even more now. So um, I've never seen anything like this never seen anything like this and it scares me i never thought that this country would witness a autocratic personality get away with what this guy is getting away with and i'm sorry if that's not a popular opinion i never try to like be too political because it's not my job uh, but i find the whole idea of freedom and the things that i was taught in school that were like made this place special i never thought that it would be threatened never thought so i'm very unsettled about um my country and i'm also frightened to death of the virus because i have multiple sclerosis so you know that's i've got an immune system that's not going to be able to handle it so i uh i've been sheltered in place since march <laughs> I don't go out. So yes. I'm trying to go out and uh, I, I I envy you when you talk about we go camping. You inspire me. I want to go camping. You know, I want to yeah. go out and camping, sure, camping's, see the camping's a good place. That's a good place to get out. You know, like you're away from people and yes, you know, it's yes. not, not an urban New York. Yeah. <laughs> and nature, area. you know, nature. Yeah. 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 I need that. I need that shit. That's like the shit that helps keep me sane. You know, yeah, through, especially yeah. through all of this craziness. And granted, I'm, I think I'm a little more, you know, like I was surprised at how much of a hermit I am. <laughs> like, what's the world when I'm pandemic? <laughs> like, my world, my, you know, other than the fact that I'm not on tour, my life is not that different. You know, I come down to the studio <laughs> and go to the gym, you know, or work out at home. But, you know, like I think that, uh, you know, I, for me, just, uh, you know, like, I, there's parts of it that suck and there's parts of it that are there's parts of it that are good. Like I, I, yeah. I don't miss yeah. a, uh, a, a fucking, you know, 26 people dying in fucking gunfire at a Walmart, <laughs> you 
you know huh. what I mean? Like some crazy white supremacist guy going and shooting up a bar or a school shootings or, you know, I don't miss that. I, uh, I really do enjoy the acoustic happy hours. I do you know, like, too. I really they like I never thought that I'd like and I never even considered doing them. Obviously, it's just because of the fucking pandemic. But now that I'm doing like I've I really enjoy them. And I really, you know, you find those little things, no. those little things that can like carry you on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like even just go, even going to the vocal, le- you know, doing the even doing the Zoom vocal lessons and, yeah. you know, just trying to get, you know, better myself and little things that I like I, if this never would have happened like I never would have done this like I probably never I you know I might have come back to you once or twice but I certainly wouldn't have focused my energy on really improving my clean singing vocals with all your techniques that you've been teaching me and you know like shit like that's a good thing like that's oh, yeah. all a good thing, you know and the I fact that you're here to do this with me makes me oh, super happy yeah. and that you're you know like that we can you know even devote some time every other week or every week or whatever we do yeah so so cool i i am so i i gotta say this in public it's an amazing transformation what you did and this is not over yet because i have a feeling that these sounds that you're making are going to be part of the the deal and even your rough stuff is going to be even be like even more better because you found like the whole instrument like you kind of found so i loved watching it i wanted to like document the whole thing and write a book about it so (laughs) (laughs) because Uh, you're uh, like playing as fast as you can and as loud as you can ah, right and now it's like ah now we're like getting in between the beats (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's one of the big things. I gotta, I gotta give you a shout out for that. Like, that's one of the big things she's really taught me about dragging the word, and you know, like <laughs> you gotta spread that hole and then drive a train through it, like with pausing yeah, yeah. the word. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and I think, like, I think that hearing that, like, I, I knew I've done that in the past, but like, you know, just doing this now and like, kind of re, you know, like when you do an acoustic version of a song, you gotta reimagine it. Like the whole thing's like yeah. complete imagining of it and shit yeah. like that like now my brain is like oh yeah like i gotta do that like you know you form yeah. whatever that neuro, that neuro pathway opens up and then you're like oh that, i can do that oh okay i'll do that you know like <laughs> been some great there has been some awesome stuff and i'm unbelievably grateful for everything that you've taught me and continue to teach me throughout this whole time and you know, even the fact that you tune into the that the acoustic shows, you're like, "What's up, uh, beers?" Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the all the all the fans are like, all the head cases are like, "Oh my God, Melissa Cross is here, awesome!" You know, like, <laughs> you're, you're your own star in your own right, you know, to them. So. I love the acoustic happy hour. I love it. I love it. It's real, like DIY. It's not pretentious. It's like the real deal. So I'm just wondering, are you going to be drinking peanut butter, like beers up, motherfuckers? Because it's this month, I'm, what I'm going to try and do to, after today, I think tomorrow I'm going to go try, to the store and I'm going to try and find a non-alcoholic uh, uh, stout. <laughs> non-alcoholic stout. <laughs> Not, I don't want to do it. I don't like O'Doul's. But uh, some kind Doesn't of like, Randy so, have one? kind of, what's that? Doesn't Randy, like, it didn't mean, I is they it- do, but I can't, I can't find that over here in California. I think a lot of time when these breweries do it, they can only kind of do like a few states around them. Like they can't do oh. the whole national level. or maybe oh. they can. I don't know. But yeah, between Friday, I'm going to just go to the store and try and find a, an NA stout. I've already told everybody like, look, I'm just, you know, just for the month. So <laughs> this is what I'm Well, you still have to say beers up, even if it's a non oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna try and find one of my ridiculously over fancy beer, like pecan flavor, pecan pie flavored stout, non alcoholic. That sounds really pussy, though. <laughs> so whack. I'm going for it. I'm going all in. <laughs> oh man. Oh well. This is really fabulous. fabulous. It has been. Thank you so much for being on No Fucking Regrets.
really yeah, thank it. you for doing this podcast i love this podcast i learn i you know i'm a follower i couldn't believe you asked me thank you thank you i was always wondering i was like i wonder if i'll ever be on that <laughs> and you got me <laughs> ladies and thank gentlemen you. that was the mighty mighty <laughs> Alyssa Cora. Bye. <laughs>